This video is brought to you by Squarespace. As many of you know, I've been kind of on a kick this summer of creating some like fairy core and whimsical DIYs to make my living space a little bit more me. As many of you also know, I love a good lamp. Basically any colorful, unnatural light source you can give me and baby, I'm there with my moth jackets on and my wallet wide open. I also love a good lantern. I have vivid memories of going to the craft store and home decor store as a young, financially deficit teenager and looking at all the lanterns they had to buy, but I couldn't afford any of them because they were like, $40? $40. So you can only imagine my jubilation whenever I remembered, oh yeah, thrift stores have those. And of course, I bought one for us to do ridiculous things to. This is the lantern in question. Um, it's not in the best condition. It's kind of broken and busted, but I kind of got a broken, busted one for a reason, because if I am going to be kind of doing ridiculous things to it and refinishing it and almost entirely covering it up, I don't need to get one that's like actually nice that someone could potentially use in their home. I would rather get one that's already kind of trash, kind of in need of a makeover. Obviously, I need to do a couple of things with this before I start making it all whimsical. Probably use a rough sanding. I don't know if it's been repainted. The surface is crusty. And then if we look inside, that's a lot of candle wax. Just it's like a bar of vanilla fudge in there. Just get that out of there. I just need to get a paint scraper and then that should come up just fine. But besides that, also, this is not even attached on. It's just stuck on there. I'm not entirely convinced that this even goes to this lantern. So roughly, this is what I'm thinking for the design. It is definitely the most maximalist option. <laughs> I don't know how closely I'm going to stick to it, but that's like the general vibes. No thoughts, no clear plans, just vibes. And if you can see on that design, I kind of have the top part of this raised so that there's like an opening in the center here. What I want to try to do, put some wooden dowels in here, just raise it up a little bit so it has more height. That way I can do more nonsense in this region of it. The last thing that I'm a little bit iffy on, if you saw my design, these were not here. That is because I do not like them. The whole design language, it's just, it's just not it for this project. I don't know how well it's going to pair with fairy core maximalism. I'm gonna try to take them off. If I can't take them off, they're just gonna stay there. I could probably pry them off, but is it worth shattering the glass that's in here? No. <laughs> so the plan for tonight, give this baby a quick sand and then just begin loading it up with vines and sprawling green things. Basically anything that involves foam clay or stuff that needs to dry, do it tonight so that it's all dry tomorrow. Sound like a plan? Good. First, we need to do a little bit of sanding. Also, before we get too deep into this, I have a very important question to ask you. Have you been putting off making a portfolio? Yeah, I kind of thought so. Um, so did I. <laughs> Until I made one using this video's sponsor, Squarespace. Past portfolio making experiences have been kind of intimidating because a lot of times you have to place all of your portfolio pieces yourself. Sometimes there's HTML involved and that is just not my vibe. But making a Squarespace website or portfolio only takes about an hour. You can choose from a wide selection of beautifully designed, customizable templates to help you get started. And with features like automatic image scaling, you can upload full portfolios of your work and Squarespace will do the scaling and positioning for you. The personal branding of your site is also fully customizable so that you can have control over text, icons, colors, and you can even get brand specific by adding different pages that you might need. And you can even embed eye-catching media on your site. Are you a YouTuber? Feature your latest YouTube video. Are you a musician or do you have a podcast? Well, you can embed said audio on your website. And with all the endless social media options these days, you can stay more connected in one place with social blocks that allow you to feature your most most important social media posts on your Squarespace site. Plus, if you sell the items in your portfolio like prints or physical crafts like the lantern I'm making in this video, Squarespace has an e-commerce platform that can be featured right alongside your portfolio site so that if people are scrolling on your site and they see something they like, all they gotta do is make one more little click and then they're browsing the wares that you're selling. And if you don't really know what the people coming to your site are into, Squarespace offers extensive analytics for every aspect of your website so that you can understand what content and products your audience resonates with. So if you finally want to make a portfolio or just a website in general, head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, head to squarespace.com slash bricklyalpaca to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to it. Let's get started. The surface paint job left on this lantern was pretty rough. It looks like it had been repainted a couple of times and then likely used outdoors. So I went over it with the orbital sander to get that rough layer of paint off. And then I did a bit of hand sanding in the hard to reach places. I also took a paint scraper to it to get all that old wax out. And then I took a heat gun to try to blow away some of that paint dust. And when it wasn't working too well, I did one of the dumbest things I've ever done in a video. I didn't break it. Oh no, that was incredibly misguided. 
excited. <laughs> After hacking at it with a screwdriver and trying not to harm the wood too much, I did eventually get the roof off, and for safety, of course, I hammered all of those leftover staples down. I then drilled a couple of holes in both the lantern frame and the roof, and cut a few wooden dowels to size and dremeled the ends since I didn't have a drill bit large enough. Okay, it is looking a little rough so far, but in times like these, you just gotta trust the process. Okay, I know this is looking rickety as all heck right now. But if I remove this top, I realize this has definitely been refinished and worked with before because there are so many unused staples in the base here that I couldn't pry out. They're like just embedded in the wood. Uh, and it made it so that I couldn't drill holes in the same place on every corner. Call this thing Legolas and slap a blonde wig on it because there is some bowing going on here. You know what, guys? It is what it is. This is not a woodworking project. This is chaotic DIY. Know your genre. <laughs> it doesn't matter because it's going to be covered up with hot glue and foam clay and potentially warbler in just a little bit here. Before I glue this on, I still kind of want to take these off. This glass is technically removable. Again, whoever did something chaotic to this in the past kind of like refinished over some of the corners that allow you to take it out. It's like that on these two side pieces. So I would need to break that down and then these need to be unscrewed. Let's try that. Oh, why is this like this? Come to mama. There we go. Boop. Insert breaking bad meme here. This is pure glass. Thankfully, now that that glass was removed, admittedly not without some destruction, I could safely break off that decorative trim. Nice. And give it a quick spray with an off-white priming paint. And while that was drying, I gave all the glass a quick scrape and clean before reinstalling all the windows Excellent. and gluing my pegs and roof into place. And take this and give you a princess. Was it worth the joke? I'm actually pretty proud of how close I got to my original illustration concept. I didn't think I was gonna be able to even do some of those things. But speaking of that original illustration concept, now it was time to sculpt on a heck ton of little vines. It's sculpting time. <laughs> To sculpt my vines, I rolled out varying sizes of little foam clay noodles and positioned them on the lantern in a way that I thought flowed well, blending with my silicone tool and adding texture where it seemed necessary. I made sure to have some vines hang off and around the raised section I created, and gave them some three-dimensionality on the body of the lantern as well. Sculpting wasn't hard as much as it was tedious. This took hours, especially with all the detail I put in, but I think it was pretty worth it. To make my little branches, I cut some thin sticks of armature wire and carefully covered them in a thin layer of foam clay. I wasn't too particular about this because tree lumpiness is realistic, and since armature wire makes them poseable, we can mess around with how the branches look later on. Say it with me, folks! I may, I may have, have gone, gone too far in a couple of places! Um, I may or may not have gone into a bit of a trance while doing the sculpting on this, and uh, she's looking well populated. So with that, we are completely done with our vine base sculpting. And that night, slightly off camera, I also went about sculpting all of my mushrooms and my moths. I have gone over how I sculpt my mushrooms in previous videos, but to give you guys a little bit of a refresher on that, I usually like to sculpt two types of fungi for these projects, a traditional capped mushroom and one with more of a shelf fungi look. I later paint these to resemble a variety of different fungi, but the base sculpts are virtually the same. And for these, I also usually use white or gray foam clay because I find that the formula is a little bit less sticky. For the capped mushroom, I just roll out a little ball of foam clay, flatten it, making sure to make it a little floppy and uneven. Then I roll out a shorter cylinder of foam clay, flatten one end, pinch the other end, and connect it to the cap by blending little grooves into the top with a sharp sculpting tool. I also carve little grooves into the underside of the cap, and then add some little creases to the outside, and sometimes I also texture the top. I like to make these in a variety of sizes, sometimes with a little bit of armature wire in the stem to make them poseable. For the shelf fungi, I roll up a larger ball of foam clay, flatten it messily on the palm of my hand, and carve grooves into it towards the center, starting from the outside, and I also add a lot of inconsistency on the outer edge, carve some grooves on the inner edge, and there you go. It only takes about a minute or so, and now you can turn yourself into your own little spooky mushroom man. 
You're welcome. For the moths, I wanted a Luna, Atlas, and Rosy Maple moth, since those are some of my favorites. So I sketched the shape of the moth onto some 2mm EVA foam and cut that out, and then covered each piece with a thin layer of foam clay, sculpted the little body out of a cylindrical piece and a little circular piece, connected the pieces, and then added little details with my sculpting tools like furriness to the body and some grooves and texture to the wings. I repeated this for each moth according to their variations, and there you go, little mini army of moths. A mini tutorial that's also useful if you just want to sculpt and paint some moths to leave around your home and confuse your housemates. A pastime that I highly recommend. So that all means, hello, today's painting day. You guys know how I said this in my most recent video? I still don't have an airbrush yet. It's one of the many purchases that I keep putting off because I don't like spending money. Well, screw that. This week, I went out. Finally got myself an airbrush. I'm sick of accumulating cans of spray paint. It's not worth it. I've used plenty of aerosol paints on the channel, but I've never used an airbrush before, so I expect the learning curve to be steep. <laughs> Especially with the cleaning and the clogging and the refilling, the transitions between different colors. Uh, in a lot of ways, I don't know what to really expect. But as to which airbrush I got, I just got the one that Kamui Cosplay recommended on their channel, specifically on their airbrushing tutorial. This is not sponsored. This one just seemed good enough for my purposes. I also got the most affordable set of airbrushing colors that they had on Amazon. So as you might guess, given that there's glass involved here, it's gonna be a little bit difficult to do a base coat on this with an airbrush. So to start us out, I'm gonna do a base coat on this by hand. And then while this is drying, I can do a little bit of experimenting and learning on my airbrush. Oh boy, this is gonna be tedious. <sighs> okay, let's do it. <laughs> I was at it. I also gave my mushrooms and my moths a base coat of paint. I just did this with some spray paint primers because I had some leftovers around. So that took absolutely forever, but I got kind of a base coat on. I actually didn't even put a base coat on everything because everything that I can get to with an airbrush without getting on the glass, I'm gonna paint with an airbrush. Duh. All right, I have done diligent reading of my airbrush manual and a bit of Googling, so I guess let's give this a shot. Am I nervous? I shouldn't be nervous. Saws don't freak me out, but an airbrush, ooh, spooky. Pretty good. It works, and it's actually not scary. Who would have thunk? Okay, so obviously painting with the airbrush worked really well for covering a lot of surface area, like on the lantern itself, but I was actually really surprised by the amount of detail I was able to get on the smaller pieces, like the mushrooms and the moths. I like to think that I'm pretty good with just a paintbrush, but the gradients that I was able to get with the airbrush, I think really leveled up the paint job for this one. I didn't expect it, but there's actually a pretty big difference between the quality and the paint job on this project and the mushrooms that I've made in past projects, even though I did use some aerosol paint on the mushrooms in those. I don't know, it always just feels good whenever I can level up my equipment and also learn how to do something new. I also wanted some cool tone light sources to use whenever I'm decorating this, so I also wired up a few royal blue LED circuits because I think the color blue looks very magical, especially since it's one of those colors that's kind of rarely occurring in nature. There was also still plenty of detail painting that needed to be done, so I added some little white spots to my red mushrooms, some stripes and details to my turkey tail mushrooms, 
and added a ton of the finer details to the bodies of my moths. I'd also like to take this moment to thank all of my wonderful patrons because they are a huge part of why I'm even able to upgrade equipment in the first place, so please take a moment, if you would, to bask in the glory of their names scrolling across your screen. The job on the lantern itself was also lacking a little bit of detail, so it got a full dry brush with some browns and reds, and finally a pass with a deep metallic bronze to really make the details pop. I also gave everything a satin clear coat off camera because it was dark out and I could not be bothered. She's looking good and cursed. Why is this my sense of interior design style? Why is this what my brain thinks looks nice? I specifically love the contrast of this and the moths that I made because here we have tiny, adorable, rosy maple moth versus an ancient relic that looks like it'll curse you as soon as you meet its gaze. I'm a big fan. Basically both facets of my personality just coming together. And I just wanna say this airbrush is a fine addition to my collection. This saved me a lot of time and I also feel like it made the paint job look a lot more complex, a lot more appealing, and I'm just really pleased with the result. And I also really enjoy the process of it, so I can't wait to use an airbrush on literally all of my projects. And yeah, hey, that includes clothes. If I put fabric paint in it, you can't say anything to me. Anyways, I thoroughly enjoy this. I think it's pretty affordable. I had no clogs the entire time I was using it, which was like... <laughs> Anyways, long story short, I will link this in the description. I can verify, it works well. We're getting off topic. It's time for the fun part. It's time to glue a bunch of crap onto this cursed thing that I have made. Woo! <laughs> This manifestation of my maximalist tendencies is now done, and it's time for the reveal.
everyone, thank you so much for watching. Isn't this so very much? I sent a picture of this to my friend and this is what she replied back. So listen, I know this is too much. Everything I make is too much and it's absolutely fine. But I am so thankful for those of you who support my too much gene and I am especially thankful for those of you who enable my too much gene, my patrons, and especially my executive producers. Breeza, Elizabeth Smith, Bean the Bread, I hang out with cats at parties, Bobo McFoe, Freya Wolf, Gravity Drop, Sweet Winter Garden, Katie, Hypnos, India Gloom, Enozine, Megan Penland, Meeks Hunter, Eloquent Silence, Low Visa, Thea Maia, Agent Dot Sketchy, The Cat's Bark, Alowen Hayes, Shay Lee, Zyle S, Dodo, Cat, Small Underscore Creeper, Francesca Sliwa, Freedom and Gus Gus, Sam Alama Ding Dong, Rose Kofrick, Rose Jaconi, Phoenix, Brian, The Cat Buses Early, and Miss Wicked. I think that's how you say that. Sometimes I think about where this stuff is gonna end up in the future and potentially like what art historian is gonna find this one day and be like why <laughs>